Thanks, Kadia. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Uh, this is a joint work that I did with uh, Professor Yi Song Yue at Caltech and our collaborators at uh, this day and stats. So let's get right to it. Uh, in this work, we study imitation learning for multiple coordinating agents. And this is our running example. We have uh, expert demonstrations consisting of multiple sequences. Each sequence is a set of trajectories of real life uh, soccer games from the Premier League in England. And uh, the goal is to learn the policy for all of the defense team from expert data minus the goalkeeper. And so uh, this is what our result looks like. For visualization, I'm gonna have the attacking team in red, um, defense team in blue, and defense team is defending on the right. And now you can see in white, uh, white are learning policies that are the results of our coordinated imitation learning algorithm. Here, the policy in white are displayed on top of the actual blue teams for comparison, but of course, they only have access to the position of the opposition. Okay, so, and the focus of the paper is to, uh, to learn multiple uh, coordinating policy using imitation learning. So let's talk about um, imitation learning for a bit. Um, here's a quick sketch of uh, a multi-agent imitation learning formulation, which uh, generalize the single agent case as well. Uh, so the data that we have has multiple sequences and each sequence in the data has, let's say, K expert trajectories. And at each time step, we receive observation XK and action AK for corresponding to some agent K. And here for the ease of notation, I'm just gonna suppress uh, all the time indices. So for each agent, um, the state, in a simplified way, you can view it as a function of its, its own observation and actions, as well as the observation and actions coming from other agents in the environment. Um, for example, you can view uh, observation as a uh, history of positions, and the actions can be the next position or the velocity. So policy, which simply maps state from actions, are typically represented by neural nets or ensemble decision tree, uh, these days, so uh, in imitation learning, the goal is to minimize the imitation loss, which measure the divergence between the actions taken by the policy and the actions taken by the demonstrator. But uh, here's the key. Uh, the loss is measured under the state distributions induced by the learning policy, which I denoted here by the uh, sub pi. And uh, this is the key difference that make imitation learning generally more challenging than conventional supervised learning because the usual IID assumptions no longer hold for the sequential prediction setting. However, there are examples of successful imitation learning algorithm in the single agent case. Uh, and in fact, one part of our method is a relatively straightforward extension of uh, imitation learning from the single agent case to the multi-agent case. So what is the problem? The problem is that in order to utilize powerful machine learning tools such as neural nets or decision trees, we need to have semantically consistent input representation. What do I mean by that? Uh, that means the state feature vector uh, typically assume that the features associated with X1, for example, are consistent from one set of demonstrations to the next. Same with X2 and X3, X3 et cetera. So, Without a consistent indexing mechanism, we are facing potentially K factorial possible input per permutation. That should be exactly equivalent, but somehow the learning algorithm has to account for it. So how do we fix it? Uh, well, the simplest thought is why can we just index the agent using the identity? Like in this case, using the player identity. The issue with identity indexing is that we uh, essentially need the same K experts giving repeated de demonstrations of similar scenarios over and over again uh, in order to, for the uh, algorithm to generalize. And so this is not practical or realistic for uh, learning from demonstrations, um, except for in very well controlled environment, right? So uh, a more promising answer perhaps, uh, similar to a previous work in multi-Asian learning literature is to look into roles instead of identity because role-based indexing could dramatically reduce the data requirement uh, needed to deal with uh, permutation. Uh, for example, in the soccer domain, one thing we can do when forming the state representation 
is to always assign the same index to, one, uh, to a particular role. For instance, the observation associated with uh, the left defender will always occupy, say, the third block of the state feature vectors. And that will give us consistent indexing. But if we think about that a little bit more, we would realize that this notion of role is heuristic, created for the sake of uh, linguistic convenience. And if we have to pin down precisely the definition of a role, uh, actually, we can see that it's not at all clear what being a left defender uh, exactly means. And on top of that, even if we have a way to define the role, in coordinated setting, roles may change even within the same trajectories. For example, two agents may swap roles, etc. So the challenge here is that we like to do role-based indexing, but roles are undefined, unobserved, and could change dynamically within the, the same trajectories. And so another way to put it is that all we get from expert demonstrations are trajectories like these with no uh, raw information. So in that case, how do we make uh, learning tractable? So the way that we make it work is by uh, alternating optimization. Instead of trying to define the roles up front, we view roles as latent variables that need to be learned unsupervised. And due to coordination, role transitions should exhibit certain structure that we attempt to model via uh, latent, uh, latent structure model, which is represented here as a graphical model, I uh, think hidden Markov model in our case, that essentially allow learning and inference of the probability of being in a certain role and also the probability of transitioning to another role. So here's a, the, the steps at a high level. Given a structure model, we invoke a role, uh, sorry, we invoke a role assignment subroutine, <coughs> denoted capital A, to index k different trajectories from a set of trajectories. And so this is the inference part of uh, the structure model. Now, if we fix the structure and the indexing assignment, we can proceed to do multi-agent imitation learning. And basically, condition on a fixed structure we can use any imitation learning subroutine that is scalable to multiple policies to update all k different learning policy. And after this updating step, now we can roll out the policies uh, over the same sequence of contexts. So at this point, we may realize that the executed trajectories no longer uh, are the best match for our graphical models parameters that we use in the first place. So what we can do is we can, roll, we can use the roll out trajectories to update the, uh, the model parameters. And uh, I denote the mo model parameters here as, as Q, uh, Q, theta, Z, theta and Z are latent variables. Uh, so we actually use variational inference to learn the parameters for uh, Q. Now we can, we can do this whole procedures by passing through the whole data set, right? But a nice feature about this approach is that it works well for stochastic optimization. The motivation is that we may want to use neural networks to train our policy. So in that case, we can train policy on uh, a mini batch of trajectories and then update the graphical models parameters using the same mini batch before moving on to the next mini batch of, uh, of demonstration. So a bit more formally, what I've just described is the algorithmic implementation of our imitation learning objective. First, we learn the coordination structure approximately via unsupervised uh, structure predictions, which give us the raw assignment mechanism A that we need to, uh, to do imitation learning. And then the optimization objective is the imitation loss that we saw before, except that it's conditioned on the raw assignment and is regularized by an entropy term that basically reflects the mutual information between the observed data and the raw assignment. And so a quick note that this, this uh, the role assignment mechanism that we construe here is technically not a differentiable operator, which motivates our alternating optimization approach. Uh, we leave end-to-end -end approach for future work. But let's uh, quickly review the three components of the algorithm that I described. First, let's talk about multi-agent imitation learning procedures. Um, what we use is an extension of single-agent algorithms into the multi-agent case. Uh, there's 
uh, several algorithms that we can use, uh, Dagger, CERN, uh, and some others. We use a modified version of Dagger. I'm not gonna talk much about it, except that in the Muntai Asian case, we, uh, we need to do cross-updating of the state feature. That means the actions of one Asian influence not only its subsequent state, but the subsequent states of other uh, Asians as well. Let me spend a little bit more time talking about the structure learning and inference component. So as I mentioned, we, we learn the parameters of our graphical models by uh, stochastic variational inference. And uh, basically as a recap, instead of calculating the observed data likelihood P of X, which is ideal and but often not tractable, variational inference instead attempt to solve an optimization problem to maximize the evidence lower bound of an approximating distribution Q, which often belong to exponential families to allow tractable solution. Here, theta is the global latent variable corresponding to the parameters of the role, which can be Gaussian distributions. And Z is a sequence of local latent variable specifying the emission and transition probability associated with each uh, of the row component. So uh, basically, we, approxim uh, we approximate the rows by a mixture of Gaussians at every single time step. In order to do stochastic variational inference, we assume the standard mean field uh, approximation, which allow us to update the parameters of theta and z while holding the other fixed, uh, so very similar to coordinate descent. And this is the visualization of the latent rows that uh, were uh, learned unsupervised. Now for the inference part, for each of the, each of the trajectories, we can uh, compute the likelihood of each agent taking on each of the role by performing standard message passing, which had linear time in, um, in the horizon and quadratic time in the number of roles. Um, with one additional twist, which is that this inference procedure so far only actually give us a K by K matrix of Asians versus row likelihood. The actual indexing is assigned by solving the mean cost uh, assignment problem, which can be done using Hungarian algorithm, for example, that takes cubic time uh, in the number of, um, of, of rows. So this step basically solves the permutation problem that we talked about earlier. And this is the numerical result. So the y-axis show the, the imitation loss with respect to the expert data over test sequences. The bottom lines show our methods, and the top lines show what happened if we ignore the structural prediction part. The x-axis is the length of uh, the test sequence. So the, 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 the learning agent is only uh, given the, the very first time frame, of course, and then the, the policy are rolled out thereafter. The imitation loss become bigger the longer the sequence, which is not surprising. But note that the gap between our method and the unstructured methods grow bigger as well. But, I mean, uh, imitation loss is not the full story. Because if we, if we visualize the behavior of the policy, what we see is that without taking the structure into account, the, be the behavior becomes severely uh, uncoordinated, or coordinated, depending on how you look at it. Um, and uh, as we've seen earlier, uh, taking the latent structure into account allows for much more realistic behavior of the agents. So another question that we like to answer uh, with our experiment is that if we forget about the structure prediction part, can we in principle just give more data to the Muntai Asian imitation learning component and hope that somehow it would work out? So we address this by running a synthetic experiment on the predator-prey domain where the four predators have to coordinate to uh, corner the prey in order to capture the prey. So this is a very well-controlled environment where the criteria for success is, is very clear. And so basically the answer is that even with more data, simple imitation learning fails to, to succeed, at least up to, the, up to the point where computation becomes a bottleneck. And so the takeaway is that even with deep learning, more data is not necessarily always the answer. Um, I've been skipping over many of the details, but if you're interested, uh, my poster number is 132, I believe. Uh, it's gonna be tonight. The data and the code available online, and I'm happy to take any questions.
We do have some time for questions. Um. Uh, so did you ever try like actually having the learned agents play soccer against each other? Oh. Um, you mean for the attacking team and the defending team? Yeah, just okay, put them on so, both sides. Yeah, the reason we focus on soccer defense in this, in this uh, experiment is because we don't have a very uh, high fidelity soccer simulator. Because if you, we can learn an attacking uh, set of team, but to play each other, you need a soccer simulator. Here the focus is we're trying to learn intelligent policy directly from real life soccer data. So, I mean, that part potentially could be to come, but it's not part of, not, not the focus of this, of this work. It's very interesting work. So um, I saw you trying to just imitate the, what happened during the field. So uh, did you try to evaluate, is that going to be a good policy or bad policy in terms of defense or offense? Yeah, no, th that's an important question. I think it's related to the previous question a bit, in the sense that because we don't have a very good a soccer simulator, so it becomes a little bit more difficult for us to evaluate exactly the quality of the policy in the reinforcement learning sense, which is why we were doing the experiment with the predator brace, because that's a very well controlled environment. The criteria for success of failure is very clear, but for us, in this case, when we learn the policy from the, from the data, uh, we are not really able to quantify exactly, okay, well, on average, how many goals uh, would you have allowed or, or not? So that's, that's not really possible just learning So we, we only look at the, at the hidden Markov model with the different emissions distribution. Uh, in principle, you can use stochastic variation or inference on other kind of graphical model, but for, for us, in, our, in this case, we feel like we don't need to because if you think about modeling the role, the hidden Markov model actually serves the purpose. If you think about every single time step, you have a role, and we care about the role transitions, right? So you can basically, from for transitioning from one time step to another, the Markov assumption is actually, uh, we feel is adequate to the model. Yeah, we have to move on, so thank you again for the talk.